Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you all this morning. And um, the weather's not too bad today. We've had a mixed week, haven't we? And, um, you know, we, England didn't do too bad, did they, last Sunday night? <laughs> and they tried very hard, I thought. <laughs> anyway, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. And so we're beginning people's choice of hymns today, and our first one is Jill's choice, and it's Father I place into your hands the things I cannot do. Oh, 
Trinity. Lord God, your Son left the riches of heaven and became poor for our sake. When we prosper, save us from crime. When we are needy, save us from despair. And that we may trust in you alone, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated as George Powell reads our lesson. The reading is taken from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 11 to 20. One in Christ. Remember that formerly you, who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Jesus Christ, you, who once were far away, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. And in one body to reconcile both of them to God, through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens of God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray for our young people here this morning. Father God, we pray for your blessing upon our young people here this morning as they go out of Sunday school. We pray that you'll be with them and we look forward to hearing from them later. <coughs> Our next hymn is Sarah Maxwell's choice. It's The Lord is my shepherd, I will trust in you alone. <coughs> the Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me lie. Yeah. 
chapter 6, verses 30 to 34, and 53 to 56. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. The apostles gathered round Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognised them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them. Because they were like sheep without a shepherd, so he began teaching them many things. When they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret and anchored there. As soon as they got out of the boat, people recognised Jesus. They ran throughout the whole region and carried the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went into villages, towns or countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplaces. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak, and all who touched him were healed. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Now, the thread found out during, uh, towards the end of last week, that he's actually got through and been accepted for training in the church. <laughs> he's worked really hard, as you do. And um, so he's had to concentrate over these last couple of years on um, like more all age kind of sermon type material. And so he, he fancied having a go at an adult sermon today. So, go. Thank you. Uh, do please give him feedback. It's important. With, within reason. Let us speak in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Have you ever been treated poorly or excluded because someone else believes something different to you? Maybe it was a church doctrine or a political allegiance. Maybe it was over Brexit. Had to mention it, didn't I? <laughs> Maybe you're the one who excluded someone or treated someone differently. Well, our readings today take petty differences, and they are petty in the grand scheme of things, as their theme. And I hope we will all see that all differences are taken up and nullified in the perfect unity of Christ. So in our Gospel today, that Chris was just reading, we find our Lord attempting to get some peace and quiet for him and his disciples. But everywhere he goes, he's mobbed by people wanting his healing and his teaching. The text begins just after Jesus is rejected by his own neighbours in Nazareth, and in between the two extracts that we heard today, we have the feeding of the 5,000 and Jesus walking on water. They weren't explicitly mentioned today, but the context is really key there. It would be tempting to read what happened as merely an example of Jesus' popularity with ordinary people, but there's something more going on here. Firstly, it's important to know where this is all happening. We're on various shores of the Sea of Galilee, a place that houses many Jewish towns, but also Gentile ones, such as the larger cities of Capernaum and Tiberias and the Greek settlements of Decapolis. In short, there are many pagans, many Gentiles, or likely many Gentiles and many pagans, among the crowds seeking Jesus not just Jews. And Jesus describes these crowds as like sheep without a shepherd. This is a really common Old Testament reference when describing Israel without holy leaders. So let's just emphasize that. There is a mixed group of pagans, Gentiles and Jews being indirectly compared to the ancient notion of the chosen people of Israel. A people who had a share in God's love 
and the promise of salvation. Indeed, when they are miraculously fed, just after the first part of our reading, we're deliberately, explicitly reminded of the miraculous feeding of Israel in the wilderness after the exodus from Egypt. Again, pagans, Gentiles, non-Jews are consistently being likened to God's chosen people alongside the Jews. This point is made clearer when we remember that this crowd following Christ, believing in him and his words, acts in direct contrast to the Jewish Nazarenes who couldn't be healed, that's at the beginning of this, uh, of this chapter, who couldn't be healed because they lacked faith. And indeed, the apostles, again, good Jews, but who worried about feeding the 5,000, didn't believe it could be possible. And when they saw Jesus walking on water, lacked such faith in him that they were terrified. So the good Jews of Nazareth, the good Jews that are the apostles, are demonstrating less faith than some of the Gentiles and the pagans following Jesus around, wanting his teaching, wanting his healing. Gentiles with faith are healed and take on board the message. Jews without faith are not. This is taken up by Paul in today's epistle. The letter of Ephesians, Ephesians is supposedly written by Paul from prison. His crime, taking a Gentile into the temple. And this within the broader context of a huge debate raging in the early church. Did Gentile converts to Christianity, they didn't call it Christianity then, but anyway, did Gentile converts to Christianity have to be circumcised? and follow the law in order to be members of the church and therefore be saved. And the debate was not just some intellectual, theological flim-flam, but deeply personal and often violent. The slang term, thrown at uncircumcised Gentiles, and it's mentioned in today's text, although it's translated as just uncircumcised, was akrobustia, which means foreskin. Oh, don't talk to them, they're just foreskins. Slang term for Gentiles. Reducing somebody down to a physical difference. Shortly after the end of Acts, during the Jewish revolt, there were great massacres. Entire cities put to the torch and massacred on both sides. Jews massacring Gentiles, Gentiles massacring Jews. This was a hot topic. And so, Membership of the chosen people, membership of the church, and your identity in relation to that was a really, really serious issue. We might see similar identity debates today, with viciousness and violence on both sides. What is a woman? What is a Jew then? What is a woman now? Paul's response is informative both then and for us today. For him, circumcision is a work of human hands. Really deliberately chosen phraseology there, a work of human hands. It's how uh, the creation of idols and the worship of idols was referenced in the Old Testament. So to elevate circumcision to some kind of divine status is idol worship. Likewise, the Jewish obsession with the visions in the temple, where priests can go and laity can't, where men can go and women can't, where Jews can go and Gentiles can't. But membership of the new covenant with God, signed in Christ's blood at the crucifixion, is spiritual and cannot be subject to merely physical and human divisions. This is why, as he elsewhere says, there is no Greek, there is no Jew. The old divisions between people have been broken down by unity in Christ. Those who have the law and those who don't, those are, who are circumcised and those who aren't, those who are Jews and those who aren't, is now meaningless. In the new city of God, all who believe are citizens. And citizen there, and citizenship, as it's mentioned, meant all that comes with that, by the way, rights, privileges, protections. So much for forcing Gentile converts to be circumcised and follow the Torah, but what is really key for Paul is that this does not mean that those who are circumcised and follow the law are wrong and must abandon the practice. 
And if he feels that Jewish Christians should continue to be practicing Jews. They are the heirs of the old covenant to whom Christ first appeared and first brought salvation. They too have a place in the new commonwealth. And this is key. At no point does he say that Jews should be ejected from the church. They must not be proud of their Jewishness and assume that that is enough to save them. But a Jew who believes in Christ is just as saved as a Gentile. Just as much as a Gentile who rejects Christ is no more damned than a Jew who does. What he preaches is tolerance and acceptance of difference, because differences pale in comparison to what unites us, membership in Christ. We are reminded of this every time we celebrate the Eucharist. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. We are all different and should not submit to some kind of violent uniformity. There is no room here for assuming anyone is right or correct but Christ himself. Could we apply this to any other current divisions? On Twitter the other day, for my sins, I don't know why I bothered going on Twitter, but there we go. On Twitter the other day, I saw a newly ordained woman's joy torn apart by Christians denying the validity of her ordination, even calling her evil and working for the devil. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely terrible. Now they think she's wrong and that female ordinations are invalid. But if she believes in Christ, she's still your sister. Could they not treat her as such? But it works both ways. On the flip side, a few months ago, I saw a tweet calling for all those who, uh, all those parishes under alternative Episcopal oversight, so that's the, that's the parishes that don't want female priests and female bishops, to be ejected from the Church of England, forcibly kicked out of the Church of England. Really? Maybe they are wrong. Maybe female ordinations are valid, as I certainly believe so. But they believe in Christ, and they are there for your brothers and sisters. Again, could you not treat them as such? Membership of the church, God's church, is not up to fads of doctrine, but faith. You can't really kick anyone out if they have faith. And this last puts me in mind of a conversation I once had with my spiritual director at the time. And I referred to Forward in Faith, which is a a movement in the church that rejects female ordination. I refer to them as misogynists. One word term, reducing them to a derogatory term, a bit like foreskins, calling, calling Gentiles foreskins. I will stop saying that soon, by the way. It's weird, I think, shouting that out here, isn't it, anyway? Um, so note that reducing the large and popular movement made up of individuals, each created and loved by God, to one derogatory word. And my spiritual director asked me whether I really thought that. Whether the decision to reject female ordination on the part of every man and woman in forward in faith was mere misogyny. And I had to admit not. After all, how could I call a reliance on well-founded arguments on scripture and tradition misogyny? I disagree with them. But I had to admit there was more going on than simply the willful sin of hating women. <coughs> and it was shortly after this that I met a priest member of Ford in Faith. It wasn't the first time, but this was, this was instructive. And I half expected the clerical equivalent of the, the Brexit here gammon. Again, insulting reduction of people to, you know, to things that I dislike or disagree about them. An angry reactionary frothing at the mouth about modern society and woke fads. But what I got was a mild-mannered, friendly, and intelligent man who was a good and faithful servant of Christ and a minister to his flock. I might disagree with what he believes, but he believes what he believes in honesty and authenticity, not petty hatred. And despite the difference, we both serve the same Lord in love and faith. 
This, of course, is not to say that we should pretend difference and even error do not exist. The very reason Paul writes his letters is to correct what he sees as false doctrine or poor behaviour in churches. But we are called upon to treat those we believe to be wrong kindly and always to see them as what they are, our family in Christ. The differences can in no way invalidate membership of the church formed on the cross. So long as there is faith, there is belonging. And this need not be church-centred learning. And I'm speaking for myself here, but what about all those left-wingers who call, or in my case used to call, Tory voters or Tories scum? Or right-wingers who feel the institution should be purged of the woke? What about t-shirts that proudly proclaim the wearer has never kissed a Tory, as if someone's capacity to be loved is found in the poll booth? <coughs> what about gender-critical feminists forced out of their employment, or trans people bullied? What about people calling for the beheading of opponents at rallies? I know or have heard of people who would have ended friendships and even left families, or who have ended friendships and even left families, over political allegiance or position taken on the trans debate. When did we become incapable of seeing the human behind the slogan? Our problem today is that of the Judeas, the, uh, Judaizers, I should say, it's a mouthful, that Paul rallied against. We assume that our differences make us what we are, that they are what give us value in each other's eyes and more importantly in the eyes of God. Just as they felt that the uncircumcised cannot enter the temple or receive salvation, so we say that a Tory cannot be kissed or a gender critic shouldn't work. We confuse intolerance of intolerance for intolerance of the intolerant, and forget that we are all welcome in the family of Jesus Christ, that we are all one body. This is a hard lesson, and it's one I'm still learning. It's hard not to hate the person you disagree with, especially when you feel that what they believe is itself hateful. But we must hate the sin, not the sinner. If we are confident we are right, we can, with tenderness and kindness, try to talk people around. If we fail, well, we do believe that all will be put right eventually, don't we? And we must leave it to God to judge how heavy are our errors. But at no point should we ever see in the people we disagree with anything other than their unique and priceless existence and the personal love of God. Amen. Amen. And if you Fred, can we stand and say the creed together? We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and was incarnate in the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and he is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. God of 
peace whose son Jesus Christ returned from the dead to become the great shepherd of your sheep. Guide us into the ways of peace and mercy. Equip us to do everything that is good and build us up to be a holy dwelling place for you, our God. Amen. Holy Father, empower all whom you have called to be bishops, pastors, teachers, whether to young or old, whether Sunday school teachers, whether it be priests, to be good shepherds of your flock. Give them wisdom and vision in the leading of your people. Pray for all who have been recently ordained and in their journey of being a curate and learning more. Pray for Fred as he prepares to go to Emmanuel in September and start his trip. We pray that you'll bless them as they journey in their calling with your equipping and growing in their lives. We pray for any who are seeking out the straying and the lost, those who are offering new hope and courage to the despair. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give guidance to all who seek to guide or reconcile others. <coughs> Protect all who are working with divided people all keep peacekeeping forces and those who seek to maintain order. Direct all who work as Samaritans or in marriage guidance. For those who are in the middle of debates, whether in the Church of England or just in society, Lord, help us to see that we are one in Christ no matter what we think and that we are still called to love one another. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Surround with your love all who are having difficulties in their relationships. We pray for all who are feeling betrayed or neglected, for all who are suffering from marriage breakdowns, for children of broken homes, or homes of hatred and violence. And Lord, we especially lift up to you the riots in Leeds and the hatred and the horribleness that's been shown. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Good Shepherd, be with all who are harassed and helpless, all who feel alienated or hostile those like sheep without a shepherd. We remember all who have lost their way and fallen into vice and wickedness, that all may know the love and care of a good shepherd. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We rejoice with all who are in the safety of your keeping in your kingdom. For all the saints in glory, we pray for all our loved ones departed and that, that we may come to share with them in eternal life. Merciful Father, have set you to rest for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Christ, the Good Shepherd, comes with peace to those who are near and to those who are far. To the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let's offer one another a sign of his peace. <laughs>
thanks to the Lord our God. It's right to give thanks and praise. It is right to praise you, Father, Lord of all creation. In your love you made us for yourself. When we turned away, you did not reject us, but came to meet us in your Son. You embraced us as your children, and welcomed us to sit and eat with you. In Christ you shared our life, that we might live in him, and he in us. He opened his arms of love upon the cross, and made for all the perfect sacrifice for sin. On the night he was betrayed and suffered with his friends. He took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His body is the bread of life. At the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His blood is shed for all. As we proclaim his death and celebrate his rising in glory, send your Holy Spirit that this bread and this wine may be to us the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy gifts, Live as one in Christ, our risen Lord. And with your whole church throughout the world, we offer you the sacrifice of praise and lift our voice to join the eternal song of heaven. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Please be seated. As our Saviour comes, so Oh. 
accomplish passes all understanding. Amen. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of Christ. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you. And with all those you love, care for, and remember this day and always. Amen. Amen. To go in peace, to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you. Tea and coffee. Yes.